Okay, well, it's 7.30, so I'm going to get started on this Facebook Live, and I'd th like to thank Trish Hammond from Plastic Surgery Hub for giving me this great opportunity. Uh, tonight, I'm talking about combined procedures in plastic surgery. Um, I've already received quite a few questions sent through, and uh, I'll start with that. But if there's any that do pop up, um, that come up to mind, feel free to write it in the comments section, and I'll track that and, uh, and get to them as I can. Okay, um, so just to introduce myself, I'm Matthew Peters. I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon at uh, Valley Plastic Surgery in Brisbane. I'm the director of plastic surgery at the Royal Brisbane Hospital as well. Um, I do a lot of skin work in terms of massive weight loss surgery. Uh, I do uh, lots of breast work in terms of both aesthetic work, such as um, breast reductions, augments, uh, lifts, or mastos. Uh, and I do lots of re reconstruction after cancer, so um, anything to do with implants or tissue-based transfers, I do as well. Um, but for the purpose of tonight, it's really just about the combined procedure, and this is a really common thing that I am asked about. I see lots of patients that have been through that enormous journey um, of uh, weight loss, and whether it be diet and exercise or some sort of bariatric surgery, um, they've lost all this weight, and they're so much happier with where they're at. They show me lots of photos of where they used to be, uh, but they're presenting now with skin, and the, the skin excess is a real drain. It's a reminder of what they've been through. Um, it's a, a daily irritation when it comes to clothing, exercise, just comfort, and, and the issues that they deal with in terms of where things are sitting, and, and the irritation is a real drag. So um, you can appreciate a, a lot of you who are watching the, the skin access is a, a problem um, and getting it managed is a, it can be large surgery. And, um, and so when the patients present, they've often got a wish list of areas and, and because there's so much, so many areas to often deal with and everyone's really busy and they've got lives to live and work to do, um, they wanna know what they can do, what they can get away with in one procedure. And so, when I'm faced with that, I basically uh, run through their history and ask them to prioritise what their main issues are and, um, and get an idea from them. If, uh, if I can only operate on certain areas, what are the ones that they, they want first? And to run you through the usual example, the tummy seems to be a really common one. Um, so it's often a question of whether it's an abdominoplasty uh, or a belt lipectomy or tidal body lift. Uh, that seems to be number one for a lot of people um, because of the functional um, impact that it has. Um, and then everything else tends to be an addition. And the next area tends to be the chest. And that can be either a lift procedure or an augmentation or a combination of a lift with an augment. Uh, or for some people, their breasts are very large and they need a breast reduction as well. Um, so there's different options there, of course. The back and the upper back, what's called a back bra lift, uh, is a really common request as well. And then we move into the arms and the thighs. And everything else on top of that, um, you know, it's, they're sort of the, the minor ones that I, I don't see as often, but the ones that I've just mentioned are really common. So yeah, I listen to what the priority list is and listen to uh, the general medical sort of state of the patient and get a feel for what they do and how they do it and how active they are, um, what sort of work um, limitations, requirements or otherwise um, they might have. And I get an idea from that about what we can possibly do. Now, questions that I've received so far, so I'll get the ball rolling. Uh, can you give me an idea of which procedures which procedures you'd be happy to group together for patients that have lost a massive amount of weight. And in answering this, um, I do take a history, obviously related to the massive weight loss, and I have to get an idea of their priorities. I need to think of their other medical comorbidities. So, um, you know, what else is going on in their lives in terms of you know, general medical state, diabetes, all sorts of other things like that. I need to know that their nutrition is really good. I need to know about their living arrangements, medications, and as I said, their work, gym, activities, all these things, so that I can get an idea of how someone can medically get through an operation safely, because that's the first thing. This is all elective and we've got to make it as safe as possible. Um, and then... Sorry. 
Sorry, I just got another message through. Okay. Um, so I've got to get an idea like what they can medically and safely undergo. Um, so yeah, can you give me an idea of which procedures you'd be happy to group together? The tummy with something else is a really common request. So I'm very happy to do a belt lipectomy or an abdominoplasty. And I'm not, often it's an extended abdominoplasty uh, or a fleur-de-lis abdominoplasty uh, in conjunction with something else like breast reduction, a breast lift, uh, or a breast augmentation with a lift. Um, that's routine, almost a mummy makeover type scenario um, in terms of grouping those two together. And on average, that procedure takes if it's an abdominoplasty with a breast reduction or a lift or something to that effect, it takes four, four and a half hours, somewhere around there, which in my mind, from a medical perspective, and I've got to think about the time under a general anaesthetic, I've got to think of the risk of the DVT in the legs, I've got to think about the time on the ventilator and whether there's issues for pneumonia development and the like, and I've got to think about pressure areas and cares. That sort of time frame is reasonable. And this is what goes through my head when I'm thinking about the patient that's got multiple requests for certain surgical procedures and then I've got to think about right, how long is that going to take me and is it safe to actually do that, okay? So the common request, tummy and breast, fine, and usually good because it fits within that time frame of the patients otherwise well. Um, I get lots of questions about can I do my breasts with my arms, okay? And I actually like that combination. It, the trouble with doing the breasts with the arms is that there's this area in the armpit and that is a sort of a watershed where occasionally when you're excising tissue and you're heading down into that zone, there's also the armpit where you're sort of bringing excess skin and trying to remove that. And there can be a little bit of watershed area of loose skin. And I talk to the patients about how I do have some limitations there. If there's loose skin in that part, we're gonna be very careful about possibly linking the scars. I don't like too many T-junctions, especially around that zone. It can have impacts on the ability to stretch up with time. And I often say, let's focus on the two areas, but consider this as stage one, and I might have to go back and do something in that junction point in the future. And I give it a good three to six months to actually see what I'm looking at and whether I can take more out by extending part of the breast scar, or if I can take the arm scar down to sort of take up some of that laxity. So I give that a bit of time, because otherwise there's competing forces and you can widen scars, you can get wound dehiscence, you can get all sorts of trouble. Um, the other combinations that are really common are areas that are very separate to each other. So doing arms with legs, okay, very common for me to do that. Um, that's usually a combination procedure that uh, are the areas that the person has so much functional concern with, um, you know, the teachers and the like with the arms, they're a group that really like to get that done. Um, and then people that are really active who are able to wear some shapewear for their abdomen and keep that back, but the thighs and that medial thigh fat pad and the movement and their exercising can be really, really annoying. Um, so doing the arms with the thighs is another really common um, combination, a multiple procedure um, that I can put together and, uh, and people can recover pretty well from. And again, a couple of hours, a couple of hours, it's within that sort of four, four and a half hour range that is really reasonable uh, from a safety perspective. Um, the other combinations that I see, um, the back uh, thighs in a separate area, not too bad, I don't mind doing that. The thighs, I'm always surprised by how well people recover with the thighs. Um, most of my patients are in the hospital for not as long as I would ever have thought. Um, so doing the thighs with another area, not a problem. I've written down belt lipectomy with arms or with breasts. That's starting to get into that six and a half, seven sort of hour sort of category, um, which, is, which is getting up there a little bit. The abdomen and the breasts, the arms and thighs, back bra with the breasts. So, um, essentially doing the circumferential work for the top zone. And that's an incredibly, um, the back bra lift is a really good operation just to lift up that excess skin that sits in the flanks that when you go into the abdominoplasty or a belt lipectomy and you're pinching and you're lifting all of that up, you just can't bring that skin down that's adherent to the ribs. And so actually sort of pulling up that skin and putting a scar within the actual bra line um, that then extends around into the scarring that we use for a breast lift or reduction is a really um, nice way to sort of give it a, a better upper back profile. All right, so they're the 
usual sorts of things that I do look at, okay? Um, if you've got any other questions, interrupt. Um, question that I've got here, why do some surgeons choose to combine procedures and others just won't? Can it also be related to the age of the patient having the op? Does it depend on each patient as to whether or not they can have their procedures put together? So I'll break that apart. So the first one is why do some surgeons choose to combine procedures and others just won't? Well, again, it comes back to that question about safety and what is acceptable when it comes to the general medical profile of the patient in front of me. So if someone doesn't have too much going on in terms of other medical comorbidities, um, then what, what are they at risk of? Certainly anything that we do on the abdomen carries a higher risk of DVT or blood clot in the leg than any other procedure in plastic surgery. So that's, that's something that I do focus on regardless of what their other medical comorbidities might be. Um, but I look at the whole picture and that to me determines how safe from an anaesthetic perspective, but also how easy it will be for someone to actually recover uh, from a chest perspective, cardiovascular perspective, pain perspective afterwards. Um, so yeah, the medical thing is, is priority number one. Now the other thing that sometimes comes up is just cost. And when, um, when you're doing these procedures, there are item numbers attached to most of these zones. And we as doctors, uh, when we're going through Medicare, there's a rebate that's sort of got 100% loading for the first procedure, 50% for the next one, and then 25%, 25%, 25% for the things after that. And that can mean that for some patients when they are doing that combination type surgery or multiple procedures in one operative setting, that their out-of-pocket expenses can be higher because the Medicare rebates and things are a lot lower. So cost is another thing. And you do see some uh, practitioners who will say, I only will do an abdominal plasty, I'll only do the arms, I'll only do the thighs. And it's often because they, they can get a uh, known gap scheme or they can get some sort of rebate that's higher by separating the cases uh, compared to actually putting them together, okay? Um, but it really does, that's one factor, but really it comes down to the medical assessment. Um, quick question, one surgeon told me it's not safe to do lipo with a tummy tuck due to changes in blood supply. How true is this? Um, so with a tummy tuck, when we do that, um, we make a cut which essentially goes around the belly button and then down low and around the hips. Now, in doing that, we lift up all that skin and fat off the front of the abdomen, repair muscles if we need to, um, all of that. So essentially, we've lifted up, in plastic surgery, we call it flat. It's just a big section of tissue, okay? And a section of tissue has to have blood supply coming in from the sides. It's used to being stuck down and blood going into the fat cells underneath. Um, but when we lift it all up, it's completely reliant on the edges coming from the top. Now, if you think about that, most commonly people ask for liposuction to the flanks around here. Um, and so that's an area which is actually the main blood supply to the flat from abdominoplasty. So if you are too aggressive and not relatively careful, uh, you can run into issues with affecting the blood supply, which then presents as a wound healing issue down the bottom. You can also, if you go too aggressive with liposuction with an abdominoplasty, it actually affects the, the blood supply throughout the flap. So if you do aggressively liposuck and then aggressively lift up to do a full abdominoplasty and then bring that down, uh, you can actually compromise the blood supply through that, which can, in most cases, present as significant wound healing issues down below. So wound healing separation or fat necrosis, which presents as some hardness, um, that can sometimes have overlying skin breakdown and just be a wound that takes a long time to heal. So it's a question of experience, the surgeon, how much experience I've got. It's a question of what you actually need in terms of the trouble there is. Being aware that sometimes it can't all be done in one hit. So some patients actually need liposuction and then a bit of a tidy up of the skin further down the track or um, you'll do an abdominoplasty and delay doing the liposuction to the flanks until a separate time. So there's things like that. Uh, another question, looking into mini tummy tuck rather than full tummy tuck, only needing a small amount of skin tightening. Also, how does fat transfer from lipo into breast work and do you do this? Okay, so 
mini tummy tuck rather than a full tummy tuck. Um, so a mini tummy tuck involves making cutters down low, okay, sometimes plus or minus with uh, liposuction. Sandy, I'm Matthew Peters, I'm a plastic surgeon at Valley Plastic Surgery in Brisbane and I'm the Director of Plastic Surgery at the Royal Brisbane as well. Um, Mini tummy tuck involves uh, essentially planning or making a definitive plan to cut out excess skin and tighten down. Um, it can be in association with a cut around the umbilicus or belly button and uh, repositioning of that uh, to try and get rid of excess um, uh, skin that needs more tightening. Or it can also go so far as to lift it up and tighten up some of the lower abdominal musculature and then just cutting out a small section of skin. So a mini abdominoplasty, like in its simplest form, is just that straight little thing, or it can be a lot more involved. Compared to a full tummy tuck, which is pretty much, we make a judgment on that in terms of how much muscle work really needs to be done. In my mind, I sort of look at it and I think, has someone got significant divarication? Um, do I need to expose all of that, reposition things? Is there an issue with the belly button where I need to make it shorter? Um, there's all of that. And then the skin excess is either cutting out as much as we can without sort of pulling the mons area up too much or um, does it involve a little short, um, little vertical line underneath the belly button if we don't take out much skin or a short vertical line above the mons area. So the full tummy tuck is more in my mind determined by the amount of muscle work that we need to do. Um, the fat transfer from lipo into the breast. So yes, this is something we're doing more and more. There was a lot of debate about this for a period of time in relation to the viability of fat going up into the breast and how we do that to make sure it takes. Um, but there was also the question of the fat going into the breast, how it could be um, determined whether little scars and cysts and things like that from fat transfer in the future were not areas of microcalcification or other things that on um, breast imaging can be misinterpreted as early breast cancer. Um, and that's been sorted out. There's lots of radiology saying that that's okay. Um, and then the other question was a theoretical one or a hypothetical one about putting fat into a breast and whether that fat transfer includes stem cells that can create a breast cancer. And there's been a lot of work looking into that. And at this point in time, we've had big changes in um, even in our medical legal circles where that has reached a point where it's accepted that fat transfer is safe and our medical defence um, insurers are happy for us to do that surgery in major accredited hospitals. Um, so yes, we are starting to look at doing more and more fat transfer to the breast. Um, I do do it. Um, I do it mainly in the reconstructive setting um, or in the hybrid setting where I'm thinking of a breast augmentation or a reduction, um, the large volume uh, transfer of fat, I'm still watching at the moment personally, but there are colleagues of mine in Australia who are doing it. Um, Janine Cox, I've recently lost 72 kilos and I've been looking into surgeries and it just says, would you recommend that? So I don't know what the rest of that is. Janine, if you could comment further, that would be great. Um, I've got other questions here. Um, so the question was, can it also be related to the age of the patient having the operation, so whether someone has multiple procedures in one operation setting? And, um, and age is important in terms of uh, anaesthetic risk, cardiovascular state, respiratory state, everything. So yes, it is taken into account. Um, there's data showing that for certain procedures, it, it is acceptable into certain age groups. Um, I take it as a case by case basis and, and see what I'm dealing with and try and most of the time when I am dealing with someone that is a little bit older, um, they do have very specific functional concerns and I can look at that and, um, and, and sort of work out a plan with them that is either the full requirement or something that's a little bit reduced based on uh, addressing the exact concern or trying to make things as absolutely pristine as we can and they're all very reasonable about that. Um, does it depend on each patient as to whether or not they can have the procedures put together? Yes, it does. Again, for the same things that I mentioned in terms of just anaesthetic risk, ability to get through an operation safely. Uh, what about recovery times? Does it matter or make a difference when you're having more than one thing at a time? Or is it really the same time for recovery? And this is a big thing. This is why people are asking for combination surgeries. Um, 
Well, all of my recovery advice really relates to a six to 12 week period um, in terms of reduction activity, a progressive return to normal activity um, in conjunction with thinking about people's pain and thinking about potential harm for recovery and getting a good outcome and thinking about their wound integrity and just strength. And so when I'm thinking about this, yes, I impose these restrictions on people that are all targeted on what I need, but also take into account their lifestyle. Um, and it applies to the whole person. And so when it comes to the combination of things we're talking about, I still apply the same six week slowdown for the tummy and the breast, the belt and the arms and the breast, thighs and things like that. But I may add extra bits and pieces. So with the thighs, I'll um, give people advice on how much to bend their hips when it comes to the sitting, toileting, things like that for the first couple of weeks. Um, for the belt lipectomy, I'll give them advice about how far to stretch when it comes to the breasts and the arms and potentially back bra lifts. I give them advice on lifting and, and hanging things out with washing and stuff like that. So there's specific things that will be in the context of the patient I'm dealing with, but the time frames are relatively the same because the physiology is the same. The pain in certain areas and how quickly that settles down, how your wounds heal, it's all the same physiology. So it, it, it's okay. Um, now, how does the recovery pain management differ for combined procedures? So pain is uh, completely subjective and individual. Okay, so um, I've got one patient operated on today who I've known for years and he just does not feel pain. He almost requests that I never give him any pain relief post-op. Whereas other people really feel it and, and you can't predict what someone's going to be like. Um, when it comes to multiple procedures at once, uh, it's a discussion of that and what someone's been through in the past and what they've needed to get through certain things. Keep in mind that a lot of patients who are presenting with massive weight loss have been through surgery in the past and the surgery they've had has involved intra-abdominal work and things like that, which, um, you know, can be very sensitive. Um, so they have experience. They've got some runs on the board when it comes to the pain relief that they've needed and what pain that they've um, had and how that's worked for them. Um, so with that in mind and the patient's comorbidities and all that sort of stuff, all these areas, again, the, the routine painkillers for an abdominoplasty are pretty similar to what I would use or prescribe for arms, pretty similar to what I would use and prescribe for thighs. Is it cumulative? Not so much. The one procedure that tends to not hurt all that much, but again, it's individual, is a breast reduction or a lift. And so when I get someone that says, can I tolerate an abdominoplasty and a breast reduction or a lift, um, I often give them advice that with the breast reduction or lift, they may feel some discomfort from some sutures that I place down onto the chest wall to sort of curve the breast in and give them a nice lateral shape. But other than that, they tend to not notice so much the discomfort with the chest and they tend to focus more on the abdominal side of it, um, which again is not that bad um, unless we, we do the muscle repair. And the muscle repair itself, what every patient says is that it feels like they've done a thousand sit-ups when they actually go to move so or if they cough, bend down, uh, try to reposition themselves in the bed. And that's something which is hanging around for a few weeks and gets better but certainly is stimulated or irritated by certain movements. So yeah, in terms of pain relief, subjective, individualized, determined by previous experience, um, considering uh, comorbidities that may be a concern uh, with some medications, thinking about the zones and the functional requirements. Um, I want people to get up out of bed, I want them to breathe really well so they don't set up pneumonias. I need them to feel comfortable so they can do their usual sort of movements. And so, yeah, I factor in why, where the locations are and what they might need, but often it's just the one regime irrespective of site. That can be different. I've got colleagues that do do a lot in one big operation and certainly their pain relief requirements can be very impressive um, just based on the fact that every area can hurt. Um, and then you can have a slowdown in function, a slowdown in ability to walk you know, in a timely fashion, a slowdown in, in their ability to breathe deeply. And so, um, yeah, certainly when you do multiple, multiple, multiple sites, uh, pain relief can be a bigger concern. Okay. 
Uh, one of the other questions I've got here, I'm scared to be under anaesthetic for too long. Are my fears necessary? And are there any additional risks with combining procedures? Um, so certainly we know from an anaesthetic perspective um, that the longer you are in a, under an anaesthetic for, you've got a greater risk of issues relating to temperature. You know, you can be exposed. Um, and the temperature in the operating theatre is actually kept quite cool because the garments that we wear are really thick and heavy and they get hot and the lights are hot. Um, now, with that in mind, that's our comfort, but we're actually more focused on the patient in front of us. We have heating mats. We've got all these other things that we apply, uh, bear huggers, all these, these things that some of you may have experienced, um, which keep you warm, okay? But the longer you are exposed, because sometimes we can't cover everything, um, the, you can uh, get quite cold. And when you get cold, your blood profile can thin, so you can bleed a little bit more. Uh, and you can run into other issues just in terms of general physiology, which can affect wound healing. Now, that is one of the things that we actively try to treat. So the longer you're under anaesthetic for, the more we are active in terms of setting up uh, these these. Uh, bear hugger systems on legs and we've got temperature monitors and catheters. We've got the, the hot pads that we put patients on to keep them warm uh, to try and counter that. So it's all in the preparation with that. Um, other things from being under, under an anaesthetic for too long, risk of DVT. If you're immobile, think of being on a plane to London um, from Perth and you don't move, you are at a risk of developing a DVT in your leg because you haven't moved. Um, now, the same can happen if you're on an operating table and we haven't you for a long time so you would a lot of people would be aware um, if you've had surgery we use stockings we use compression devices that actually squeeze the pump muscles like in your calf uh, to actually actively move the blood and we often give injections that actually thin the blood as well so we're doing that to try and sort of keep you safe um, and to minimize your dvt and then of course a big part of that afterwards is getting moving and trying to sort of keep that, that risk as low as possible. Um, the other thing is the chest. If you're under an anaesthetic with an airway and, um, and that's an anaesthetic side, but certainly afterwards the pain relief and physiotherapists involved to try and sort of counter that, really get the chest moving, okay? Because the longer that you're lying flat for, the less sort of movement of the lungs due to gravity, uh, we get you sitting up right and move. Otherwise you can get some fluid just pooling in the bottom of the lungs. The lungs do produce fluid, so they say lubricated and they move. Um, but that can just pool in those areas if the lungs aren't stretched open and that can set things up for an early temperature post-operative, that's called atelectasis, uh, or beyond that potentially even in pneumonia and that can have massive implications for how you heal if you're coughing a lot, especially if you've had an abdominal plasty. Okay. Um, are there any additional risks with combining procedures? Not particularly, except for being very mindful of all of the things I've mentioned, but also pressure areas. So um, when you do go off to sleep as a patient, uh, one of the final things after we uh, set up what we need to is to think about where your important nerves are. So there's very important nerves in the shoulder that supply obviously the upper limb, around the elbow, on the outer aspect of the knee uh, as well. And there's a few other ones here and there. And if those areas are resting um, in the wrong spot, if you think about yourself, you you know you have a really big sleep and you wake up in the morning and you've been lying on your arm in a funny way, you can feel really numb or dead. Um, we don't want to do that to you. We don't want you to have any dramas like that. We also need to think about areas that are really bony. And so the elbows, um, parts of the shoulders, the heels on your feet, and if they're resting on a really hard surface um, for too long, you can actually get an effect on blood supply in the, in the heel, for example, and that skin can die. And that is a wound that can be an absolute nightmare to manage. So the longer you're on, you're on an operating table for, the greater the risk. But these are things that we know about and we actively look out for, prepare for, prevent. Okay. So that's, um, there's some of the things that we do there. Now, I've got some other questions. If anyone else has anything further that they want to ask, uh, I've got another one here. Uh, what can I expect when going in for an operation for a tummy tuck and mons reduction? So one of the big things that's just not spoken about is the mons area. Um, 
when it comes to massive weight loss. And you put on all this weight through the abdominal region here and then down in the bottoms, there is a fat pad there that sits over the pubic tubercle and the pubic symphysis, which are the bones in the area that form the front of the pelvis. And, uh, and they, of course, when you put on weight everywhere, it gets put on there too. And one of the effects with that is that it stretches up that skin in the pubic region and, uh, and that can stay extremely stretched up. So the Mons reduction, I do that uh, almost routinely with tummy tucks these days um, it, because if needed, it's, it's a judgment, um, because if, if you don't deal with that, then obviously you've got this nice profile up above, uh, but you can have a bit of a bulge down below and it then needs secondary revision. So what can you expect uh, in going in for a tummy tuck and Mons reduction? It's not too dissimilar to a tummy tuck, as in we determine what skin to, to take out, we look at your abdominal musculature, we repair all of that. Um, it's a judgment in the original markup. So um, I tend to ignore the crease that you have, especially if someone needs a MONS reduction. And I'll focus on other anatomical landmarks where I'll measure six and a half centimetres up from down below. And that sort of then comes to the point where the pubic symphysis bone is, and I know that there's, a, there's an adherence point there. And then any skin that's sort of above that, that's hair-bearing skin and contributing to that fullness, I actually cut out as part of the abdominal plasty. Um, you can get after anything like that, especially when you're cutting that low, a little bit of swelling in the mons area. Um, but that's about the only thing that, that is different compared to an abdominal plasty, okay? Um, I've got another question here. Wanting to know if fat transfer gives the same or similar look as implants. Okay, so again, this is coming back to that question about um, uh, do I do fat transfer to breasts? And this is relatively new territory in Australia for um, breast surgery, doing primary breast augmentation or even revision, just using fat alone. Um, now, you can get the same or similar look as implants, but only if you have a small breast envelope really to begin with. Um, that's based on uh, experience, but also more reading around. This is not something that I've done large volumes of. There um, certainly is a lot of work that's been done in the United States looking at this, and there's the potential that um, colleagues of ours are doing larger volume breast fat transfers. The thing with fat transfers is that you need to basically put the fat into tissues where it's almost seeding it. You're putting it in and it's got a, each fat cell has to be in communication with an, a, a, a vascularized area so that it survives. And if you essentially just go in and just inject a whole ball of fat into the middle of the breast, almost like the same sort of shape, size, whatever, as an implant, then the only fat that's actually touching vascularized tissue is the stuff that's on the outer aspect of that ball of fat. And the stuff that's inside can just liquefy, turn to oil, resorb, get walled off, become infected hard, all these things. So there's a bit of unpredictability with that, that central core if you go with a large volume. Um, which brings me back to the point that can you get a similar thing? More so with the smaller breast cases in terms of injecting fat up to 300 cc perhaps. And that's about it uh, in my hands at the moment. Um, and again, what the region that I've got more experience with is doing the hybrid type things with an implant, um, especially in revisionary work or in the breast reconstruction setting um, in terms of doing that. But the, 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 the basis is the same. You've got to have fat that you take out of somewhere for it to live, it's got to be able to get a good robust blood supply for it to work. And so there can be concerns with doing massive volume transfers if the size of the bed um, isn't, isn't big enough to actually fit um, the amount of fat you're moving in. Uh, are there any long-term problems? Um, I'm guessing this is with fat transfer. Um, I was talking about fat transfer before and the theoretical concerns which have been looked into. Um, one of which was how do you, when it comes to screening for breast cancer, differentiate fat that's been injected and potentially has caused some scarring 
from areas of scar, microcalcification, or other little subtle signs that they use when looking at mammograms or ultrasounds. Um, so looking at that sort of stuff um, but from a radiologist perspective, and they've worked that out, they've actually got criteria that they use to differentiate the two. Um, and the other thing is just the debate about if you inject fat from somewhere else up into breast tissue. Breast tissue is hormonally sensitive tissue and it has the uh, ability, as we all know, one in eight women potentially will develop breast cancer. And, um, and there's always been this debate at conferences and in the press about transferring fat up there and will that potentially trigger a breast cancer. Um, and that's been looked into pretty significantly and, and I don't think any of us have a hand on heart definitive answer because we haven't got data of 30, 40, 50 years of experience in fat transfer to breasts, but certainly there's starting to be some suggestion that, that it's safe enough. We do big volume transfers of fat up into areas after breast, breast reconstruction where it comes to taking like abdominal fat as a free flat, train flat, deer, you may have heard of those, where we'll take tummy tuck skin and fat that we normally throw away and actually connect it up to blood vessels in the chest to reconstruct and make a whole new breast. So that's taking a whole big paddle of fat and putting it up there. And we've been doing that since the 80s uh, and without effect. So um, that that's always been safe and never been a concern. So that's what we're basing our logic on now, mainly when it comes to working out if fat transfer to the breast is safe. Um, would I recommend fat transfer to the breast in someone who's had so much surgery in the past two and a half years? After five surgeries, three different implants and lifts, the outcome has been unsuccessful. Could it be my body or just the wrong surgeon for me? Look, it really, there's so many factors when it comes to breast surgery. Um, you've got to think about the skin envelope and you've got to think of the breast tissue that's inside. Um, and you need to think about obviously the muscles, chest wall, anatomy in terms of the lie that we've got the ribs and the sternum, um, and then all the structural little supports that are holding that all together. And I know that when you get into, in the primary breast augmentation case where someone hasn't ever had anything done before, um, you go through skin, fat, some breast tissue, and you come down to the pec major muscle. Pec major muscle is adherent to the ribs. You swing around to the corner of the pec major muscle. There's all these little fascial attachments between that and the underlying pec minor, but there's also attachments out to the lap dorsi muscle in the back. There's all this native anatomy that's never been disturbed. And you can go through the pec muscle, you can create these pockets, you can preserve all of these ligamentous, these fascial areas out to the side that act as really good support uh, to hold implants in. Um, you can do all of that, you can see all of that from the word go in the primary organ. Um, the skin, skin is dependent on weight loss, pregnancy, breastfeeding, all of these things. Um, they, they can, that's a different matter and that's often where the internal work that we do with the breast implant can be quite different to the skin work. It's why sometimes we've got to do a lift. Um, it can be the total determinant, the difference between the two as to how much surgery you have to do. In a scenario like that where you've had five surgeries, three different implants, you've had lifts and things are just not successful, You've got to keep in mind that sometimes you can't get back to where things were when you didn't have anything done. And there can be areas internally where the, the supports laterally, the supports inferiorly, there's all these things that have been disrupted from previous surgery, movement of implants with time, stretch, uh, that has meant that you, you actually need a full reconstruction of the internals before you actually see the benefit in terms of how it looks externally. So. It can, um, it, it's the question here, how come it's been unsuccessful? Could it be my body or just the wrong surgeon? There's, there's both. It could be that the body itself has had multiple things happen to the internals. Um, the external with the skin um, can be something that has been relied upon too much to be a support or it's been affected by a lack of internal support over time. Um, so it could be elements of your body in response to previous surgery or genetics or just weight loss, pregnancy, all those things that can happen in terms of impacts on skin. Is it just the wrong surgeon for me? It comes down to what surgeon you're dealing with and what sort of experience they have. Um, many of the plastic surgeons I know in Australia are really well trained when it comes to 
um, multiple procedure breast scenarios. Um, the primary augment putting an implant in um, is often perceived to be very simple. Um, I feel it's not. It's, it, you've got to maintain those internal structures that I commented on. Um, but the revisionary stuff can be very complicated. And a lot of us in plastic surgery throughout our training see a lot of that and, um, and, and you know, ask a surgeon, make sure that they're comfortable. Um, and if they're not, um, based on the experience they've had to date or lack thereof, we all know each other pretty well and we should be able to diverge into the right direction. Okay. Um, are there any other questions that I've got from the group out there? Um, I've come to the end of this list that's been sent through to me here. Um, one of the common things that I am asked about um, is in relation to arms and uh, is in relation to thighs and tummy and whether that can be done at the same time. Um, and personally, I try to, I try to suggest to people that they do separate the tummy from the thighs. Um, the logic for that is essentially when it comes to the whole issue of pain, mobility, all those things, when I'm doing a tummy tuck and I'm pulling skin down and then I've got leg skin that I'm sort of pulling together and then pulling up, um, I just find that it concentrates a lot of discomfort around the pelvis um, in patients. and. When it comes to sitting and the limitations on all of those things, I've just found that that's something where some patients have had a bit of discomfort. So I try to encourage people to separate that. The garments that we often use for abdominoplasty do up in the pelvis. Um, the wounds that exist in a thigh reduction, uh, we've got to modify things otherwise in terms of longer garments on legs and how that all works with toileting can be difficult. Um, it is possible. Uh, but it is something that I usually try and indicate to people that we focus on getting the tummy right, the tension's right there, and then look at doing the legs uh, separately. Um, but having said that, if someone is adamant that that's what they want, I walk them through the pros and cons of it. I do have a colleague in Brisbane who, who does it and seems to be pretty comfortable with doing that combination, um, but it's something that I've just seen people have some trouble with, so I usually try to, to, try to, try to um, um, make them consider that if there's a few things there that they might want to reconsider what they're doing or asking for. Um, the other thing that I try to point out, I've, I've written a few notes here, um, when you do do multiple procedures, uh, there's often little watershed areas where, say you do, I mentioned earlier, doing the thighs, with a, we are doing the arms with a breast lift or an augment or a reduction or anything like that. In the massive weight loss patient, you've often got this loose skin that's extending around the side there and it's quite full and it's really hard to manage in a bra strap. So it's sort of got these broad bra straps with these heavy breasts, um, autotic breasts and trying to fit it all in can be really difficult for a lot of these women. Um, and so when you, you're sort of dealing with that side, that tissue there with a breast lift reduction, augment mastopexy and thinking about doing your arms, there's this definite watershed area where I can only do so much based on how the scarring comes together. So whenever I am doing the multi-area stuff, I think about these watershed areas and, and try to um, counsel the patient to be prepared for a potential second operation about six months after surgery um, so that I can see how the scarring's gone, whether there's any laxity that needs a further tighten up, because that is something that's really common in massive weight loss surgery and that all my patients I advise, that I tighten things as much as I can, but they can just be little areas that swelling and the like because the collagen and elastic fibres just don't exist to the extent they used to. You think about a newborn versus yourself, there's really tight skin in a newborn versus all of us. Um, so you can have this recurrent laxity and especially giving it time after surgery in the watershed areas, seeing whether you need to tidy up anything else in the other areas can mean that you can do a simple fix and make something look heaps better, but safely target the areas in between. So the, the axilla or armpit and that loose skin in there is a really common area that's a watershed that I, I counsel people, hey, just give this a bit of time and we'll see what happens. Um, 
the moms area at times, depending on how far I have to go with things, sometimes there can be a bit of a current laxity there if we're talking about laxity. Um, the breasts, completely different story, especially when it comes to augment mastopexy um, and just the lower pole and just loose skin there as well. And that's that can be a watershed thing that we have to be careful with in terms of how tight you might make things or how heavy an implant you might place in there. And there's things that we have to be careful about with that. Okay. Um, Post-operative recovery I was talking about earlier. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions about that again. Um, but the thing that I've highlighted quite a few times is DVT. And, um, and that's a really important thing with these combination or multi-procedure things. Um, I, I get all of my patients to continue wearing stockings for a few weeks afterwards. And, um, and I'll quite routinely indicate to patients that they need to um, think about having almost an alarm system on their phone so that they can be reminded to get up off the couch and actually just walk around the house a bit to keep themselves moving. Uh, we do know, especially after any of the abdominal tightening surgery, that your DVT risk is higher than um, any other operation that we actually do in plastics. And, um, and to that end, it's really common for us to send our patients home on continued uh, anticoagulation therapy, whether that be simple aspirin uh, or extending through to heparin or even clexane injections based on a person's risk. And we see it all. We've seen patients with previous DVTs after certain surgical procedures. Factor V Leiden is a very common mutation uh, in the blood system of patients. It's present in up to 15% of the population. And so we have to be very careful in terms of DVT risk in that group as well. Um, we need to explore people that have had pregnancies and whether they've had any issues with DVT in the past as well. And that can, they can all be things that mean that we have to go to that next level of DVT prophylaxis or prevention, uh, including injections. Um, and there's different things and it's quite common for us to involve uh, the haematologists who are the blood doctors um, to help us out in that regard. Okay. Um, the question earlier about pain relief and how much we need to modify for things like that. What I tend to find with these sorts of combined procedures is that after the first week, most patients are noticing discomfort with certain movements in terms of, especially if it's abdominal, they're just finding discomfort with reaching down to pick things up, with coughing, straining or otherwise. So it's a case of being smart about what you're doing and having everything set up before surgery so that you don't have to be so active with your movement. Um, so thinking about what you're doing for having the house prepared, meals, what are we doing with kids, transport with cars for kids, for school, all these things are really important to try and minimise your exposure to episodes that might cause you discomfort. Um, but certainly if they are to occur, then having appropriate pain relief in place to help you out. And most of my patients after the first week of surgery are perhaps still taking some Panadol, some Endone or an equivalent such as Plexia. Uh, as a breakthrough pain relief and they might need that. Most people at night time, at the end of the day, they might notice that they need that. Um, there's plenty of other options and it's really, it's routine practice for us to touch base with our patients after a week um, to see how they're going. And one of the questions first up is how their pain is and is it working, all that sort of stuff. Um, so we um, uh, include that sort of discussion to make sure you're comfortable. But after that first week, things are actually getting pretty good. And especially with this combination stuff, you will feel inclined to slow down a bit because you'll feel tight in certain areas. You'll notice for certain activities that it's a bit of a stretch and you'll be concerned about tapes and dressings moving. You will have restrictions from garments, that's normal. Um, and you will find that swelling and the like also is affecting things. Um, but moving forward from there, things get better and, and I routinely, our patients come back one week, three weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, and then six months after that. And, um, and certainly the first week as discussed, but then at week three, I'm seeing patients really moving around and doing all these things. So um, getting, just getting better with respect to um, ability to move without needing pain relief and getting back into regular activities. Um, there's a question here. I'm looking at having my arms, breasts and tummy tuck done together with fat transfer. Um, look, that, that's a combination that I do do. 
um, doing arms with um, with breasts and with tummy tuck. So I tend to be someone that tries to to limit things at the most to about three particular areas, just based on the length of time that I was describing from an exposure perspective, temperature perspective, blood thinning perspective, DVT perspective, pressure area and care perspective, ventilator perspective, post-op pain relief and recovery perspective. Um, it's very common for me to do arms, breasts and the tummy um, if they're the things that the patient needs. Um, anything beyond that, I start to really focus on length of time that it will actually take me to do that. And, um, and what the risk is for the patient with all of those things. So that's a good combination um, if needed. Uh, I've got a question here about what's your opinion on using drains for thigh lift, as I know some surgeons who don't use them. Um, drains, drains here and there, I think it is an experience thing um, and it's something that, um, like I don't use drains for my arms. I don't routinely use lots of drains for breasts anymore. Um, tummy tucks, I now use smaller drains than I ever used to use. Um, belt lipectomy, I used to use four drains and now I use two. Um, thighs, I do still use drains. Thighs are an area where the thickness of the tissues that we're looking at, um, they can, um, depending on the machines that you use as well, so I use something called a plasma blade, which is a new diathermy device that only gets up to a maximum of 65 degrees compared to a routine diathermy that gets to 350. Um, and those sorts of devices, um, they can, in some of the areas where you've got more fat, cause breakdown of cells and they can cause more leak and potential seroma. And, um, and that's something that with the plasma blade, I'm not noticing as much of that. And that's, there's research backed as well. Um, but I still put drains in just because they are large spaces. They still there's still enough tissue cutting and the like that you can just get fluid leak. And there's a lot of lymphatics and other things in the thighs where I can only relate, only really rely upon the compression yarn so much. So I personally like to keep drains for the thighs, but that really is individual. As I said, I don't use them for the arms. I rarely use them for the breasts. Um, I always respectfully ask the patient or tell them that if I'm worried and someone's particularly oozy and I just think I'm just going to put a drain in just to be safe, um, then then I respectfully ask that I've, I've got that option. Um, but yeah, there are some routine things. I still do use drains for the thighs. Um, we've got more questions coming in. I had a brachioplasty in November and there's hypertrophic scarring and the cut is running down the back of the arms. Uh, of ETT and BL and VR with no issues with scarring. There is still quite a bit of fat and skin to remove. Would this assist to move the scarring to run inside of the arm? So I, when I'm planning a, an arm reduction or um, tightening, I do use essentially, there's a crease we've all got and uh, it sits between the bicep muscle and the triceps and I use that as a landmark. And so that is where we, try to place an actual scar in that zone because when you are walking day to day down the street, you know, the arm, the scars inside and this area and our climate with singlets and things like that, you, 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 you want that area and you want the area behind where people can see you walking on the street. Um, you don't really want massive evidence of having had something done. So it's, it's pretty routine for a lot of us to try and you'll see that in photos and lots of galleries of different surgeons. We try to put the scar in here. Now, if you've got hypertrophic scarring, there's a reason why you get hypertrophic scarring, and that's because your body's recognising that there's just not enough holding the actual skin together, and so it throws in all of this extra collagen and all of this tissue stuff to just try and cement it together. Um, so hypertrophic scarring is just part of the usual process in response to a lack of support. You can do things in terms of, from a surgical perspective, put different sutures in that hold things together internally, you should never really particularly rely on external sutures alone to hold the wound together. Um, as soon as you take an external suture out, seven, ten, two weeks later, um, that, that wound is still only about five to ten percent of its final strength. And so if you don't have internal sutures holding that together, um, the scars can, can have a, a separation which then stimulates that scar area to increase the amount of collagen produced and you get a thicker scar. So you do see that. Um, 
the things you can do now, you can take, you can try and take that tension off the area. So instead of it wanting to keep like it's feeling like it's falling apart, you can support that. You can think about compression, you can think about massage with silicon. Um, some people inject steroid injections, but you want to go with the low dose stuff first. Um, the good news with hypertrophic scarring is that it often it's meant to settle down around 12 months post op Okay, scarring takes 24 months to fully mature, but hypertrophic tends to show some resolution within 12 months. Um, and certainly some of those activities I've mentioned can improve it. Um, the question about you've still got quite a bit of fat and skin to remove. Um, whenever there is a situation where there's still extra stuff, if, if there's an ability to sort of make a cut on the other side and then pull that scar around, um, then that might be one way to to improve the situation for you, but that's totally dependent on where the scar is and whether the distances and being able to roll it around is achievable or not, but it's something to potentially ask. Uh, there's a question here. Hi, I've recently lost 72 kilos, so I have lots of excess skin. <coughs> I've been told I'll need a flow de lee and I'm having three 10, and with having three 10 pound babies, I need muscle repair as well. I've also lost all of my breast tissue at the point I literally just have skin there, plus my thighs and arms. What surgery do you reckon I should look to do first? Um, based on what I've seen people do um, in terms of priorities, most people in your situation would think about getting the tummies done, tummy done first, um, and you can do that with the breasts as well. So that combination is, is pretty good. Um, the thighs and arms, you can add the arms as well, but it comes down to how much work might be necessary with the abdomen. Um, is it just a fleur de lis or is it a fleur de lis belt lipectomy, um, which sometimes you've got to do. Um, and sometimes there's liposuction on the back and all sorts of things like that. So certainly uh, uh, the abdominal thing that you'd commented on there, that was the first thing you'd mentioned in your, in your question. So I think that's that must be up there with your priorities. And based on the patients that have operated on over the years, they're the sort of things that they do see an improvement from massively. And uh, and then it sort of sees their improvement in quality of life get there. And then it sort of moves from there in terms of just better function overall. So I'd probably say look at the tummy if that's your priority. Um, and you can think about doing the breast at the same time. Um, another question about fat transfer after implant removal. Um, and I've spoken about that before. This video is usually kept up online afterwards. Um, so just in the nature of considering time, I might defer that one. Um, I'm having a tummy tuck and lungs reduction next month. have four kids. Um, I've, I've answered that one. That's there. Um, my breast lifting reduction is horrible and painful. Uh, recovery, you're right. It's subjective. My girlfriend was back at office work in three days. I struggled for six months. It is all subjective pain. Um, but there are some things that can cause discomfort and we have to be careful with that so that, and point it out to patients so they're aware. Um, what is your opinion on people thinking of doing a tummy tuck or any surgery in Thailand as the costs are more affordable? Because in Australia, for people on low income, it's extremely hard to pay for treatment here. Um, look, through my role in the public sector, I do actually see a lot of cosmetic tourism go wrong. Um, and I'm not wanting to discredit some of the surgeons who may exist in some of these other countries, but I do see things go bad. Things can go bad for any of us. Complications do happen, um, but it's the management afterwards. And certainly if I ever have a patient that has a problem, uh, then that's my problem. I own the wound, I own the problem, and I have to sort it out, and I'm available. And this thing lives with me, it's next to my head pretty much at night. So there's, you know, my patients have my phone number. So if there's a concern, people can get in touch with me and I have to deal with it. And that's just a lack of support that you have when you go overseas. And then you're reliant on uh, a system over here which has to try and tidy it up. And you've got surgeons who don't know what's been done, um, techniques that might be different to what we've done or we have learned how to do. Um, or done in a way that we wouldn't necessarily agree with. Um, and trying to fix those things can be pretty hard. So from experience, I've seen quite a few disappointed patients when it comes to some outcomes and complications and how they've been managed. I've certainly seen some patients get some really nice results here and there. But in my line, in terms of what my patient population that I see with this cosmetic tourism, 
Um, it's usually more problems than the alternative. Um, in terms of cost, that's really interesting. I actually get quite a few people when you actually talk to them about the overall cost of going to Thailand, doing this sort of surgery, dealing with the cost of everything, it actually for some patients becomes almost comparable. I can recall a lady who had abdominoplasty, augment mastopexy, and her arms done two years ago. She paid almost $30,000 out of pocket to go to Thailand to get all that done. She came back very upset with the result and when I spoke to her, she suddenly realised that she would have actually had a hospital stay, all sorts of things actually covered because she was eligible for the Medicare item numbers after having lost lots of weight after a gastric sleeve. But she just didn't know that she could access those and decided that it would just be too expensive and went overseas. And it cost more than what I would have charged to do the same stuff. So you do need to weigh up the real figures and actually work out what's, what works. Um, what's the recovery like from a fleur de lis and how soon could you go back to work and gym? Um, so my advice is one week doing not much to your ex self cares, two weeks where you're doing walking, pushing trolleys, carrying milk bottles back in the house, um, starting to do desk based, kitchen based sort of stuff. Um, and then after three weeks, heavy laundry basket, reaching up to hang it out, increasing to treadmills, 15 degree angles, thinking about stair masters, thinking about dumbbells, tricep cables, just especially with the abdominal stuff. I don't want any sit ups, planks, any abdominal focus work for 12 weeks. Okay, so that's my general advice for anything abdominal. Okay. Uh, how much are the approximate cost of mini tummy tuck and breast lift and augment? Depends on what you have, what you need in the abdominoplasty part for. So have you lost lots of weight and you're actually Medicare criteria appropriate? Um, do you have an overhang of skin that's causing rashes and, and issues there? Um, I think the broad range for a mini abdominoplasty out of pocket from a surgeon's fee perspective is probably in the three to four, anywhere up, depending on the surgeon. And there can be massive differences between Brisbane, Sydney, Sydney, Melbourne, um, in terms of what the costs are. I think for me, for out of pocket for a tummy, mini tummy tuck is around four something. For a full tummy tuck, it's in the sixes. Um, but you do get rebates back from Medicare if you meet the criteria. Um, and each case is really dependent on, on on what I'm dealing with and, and certainly there's other stories here and there where we have to factor in other stuff. Um, breast lift and augment, so an org mastopexy, it's pretty much the price of an augment plus then a lift. Um, so you'll often see most surgeons charging anywhere between late sevens, eights and up. And there's surgeons around that are charging uh, 12, 15, 18,000 just for their fee alone um, for that procedure, okay? Um, is it usual for a cut to run uh, on the inside of the arm and only visible when you lift your arms with an arm reduction? Why would the cut be placed on the back of the arm as this is fully visible? Um, comes down to surgical training and what someone's been taught, but there's also sometimes times where if that's where the laxity is and that's where the tissue excess is, sometimes you've got to cut out where it is um, and you can't move things all the way around. Um, I can't think personally of many instances where I would put a cut in the back of the arm. I, I do set it up, um, but it depends on the situation that was, was at play and, and the training that that person has. Um, is it Medicare rules you can't have arms and legs done together? They've got separate item numbers, so you can. There is a thing about different combination stuff, but there are separate item numbers for that. Um, so I haven't encountered problems. Um, how much does Medicare cover if you have had children? I've heard that if youngest is seven or under, there is a rebate. So certainly when it comes to a, a mastopexy, um, if you've breastfed and your youngest is less than seven, then there's something called the pencil test. And it's a weird set of photos, but essentially we get our nurses to put pencils underneath the breast or you can do a tape measure. And if the nipples sit below in photos, you can, re you can access the Medicare item number for a lift. Okay, um, if the nipples are sitting above the pencil or the tape, then it's considered a cosmetic lift. Okay, um, do you pull the mons up? Yes, I do. I always look at the mons in terms of trying to see if I can correct that for people. It's something that with time I've learned I cannot ignore. I need to look at the mons and try and get that up. If you don't, you can get a bulge down in the underwear and it just doesn't look right. 
Um, there's a question, there's a comment there. I have my do mons done as part of my fleur de lis. Look, it's routine to look at that area and get it up. When you're doing a fleur de lis, you do have to think about the T junction element of it, and you can end up with wound healing things. So, with a T junction, there can be a bit of tension there, and you can get issues with hypertrophic scarring, wound breakdown, or otherwise, if you're too aggressive with a fleur de lis. Is it possible to just get a MONS reduction? Yes, it is, okay? And sometimes that can be liposuction alone or placing a scar like a mini abdominal plasty and cutting out the skin from the MONS and bringing that up without disconnecting the abdomen, okay? So that's that's actually an operation I do quite often. And um, yeah, the liposuction sounds less invasive, but it tends to be more painful, okay, than actually, and it leaves loose skin. So um, doing the proper MONS reduction works out better. Um, after having an extended tummy tuck, yes, you can. You just go through the uh, scar and cut out that skin and then lift it up to your scar position, okay? Uh, mon swelling post-operative, does this ever go? Some people, yes, okay, some people, no. It depends on the lymphatics through that area. It's an area where it's the lowest point, okay? So you can get a bit of swelling. Um, occasionally, there can be swelling there that people just weren't aware of pre-op as well, um, but often it's just worsened by just the lymphatics in that zone. Um, I give it time if people have that, but I'm looking out for it too. And if someone still has it six to nine months post-op, then I will talk to them about potentially doing, like opening up their scar, cutting out a bit and looking at the layers. So you've got skin, fat, and then you've got this scarpers fascia, and then you've got a fat pad under there. And sometimes it's useful just to cut that out and reset things back. Um, uh, would you suggest fat transfer after implants are removed? Jeez, lots of questions now. <laughs> Um, then uh, I've, I've mentioned that one before. Um, good to hear about fat transfer. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Uh, what else have we got here? Vanessa, hello. How long do you suggest you are at a stable weight for before having surgery? We have a requirement for six months, okay, according to the Medicare criteria. So um, you should do that. My advice to everyone is reach something that is stable that you can actually maintain. You know, a good diet that you're comfortable with. It's not a yo-yo. It's not some sort of very low calorie thing to achieve a goal. It's got to be something that you can live with post-op. Um, and with, with that, um, something that you can, you know, exercise programs well attached to that. Um, what is a stable weight, five kilograms up or down? Look at where you've been and look at, especially if you've had bariatric surgery and you've gone from 150 and you're down to 95, but you're doing that 95, 97, 95, 97, that's stable, you've plateaued. So look at your graph and see whether you're in that zone. Um, thank you, Beck. Um, uh, Lost a great deal. Do you do coagulation studies to try to predict DVT? Not as a routine, okay? Um, so um, coagulation studies, my, my patients do get bloods on and off depending on the medical assessment, and that's something that I do in conjunction with the anaesthetist. Um, uh, Traveling to see, that's good. I'm just flicking through, because I understand a lot of you have been watching for a while. Um, What do drains actually do? Drains actually do two things. They remove fluid so that things can stick down properly between the two, um, but they also have a vacuum effect which locks things in place. Um, so especially like if you take out an implant, for example, and then put a drain in, um, like that space internally can produce a lot of fluid. Um, and if you don't have something to suck it away, um, it can just keep filling up and you can develop a seroma. Um, and that can just be a nightmare to manage, especially if they get infected. Um, do you look at revision cases? Yes, I do all the time. Seven weeks post-op after velopectomy and breast augment. Um, if, you're, if you're only seven weeks post-op, I'd give it time, Tracy. I'd let, I'd let it sit down for a little while and just work with your surgeon and see if there's, um, if, um, yeah, and see, see if things settle down. Um, I'll see another comment from you now. Seven weeks post belt lipectomy and BA has severe tight vertical banding all down the abdomen, not loosening. Also, ski slope like buttocks now that it's flat, require lift due to having too much skin after implant placement. 
So that's severe pain in breast, waking at night, tight pain from breast. Look, you, you need to talk to your surgeon and just sort of really keep them in the loop about that sort of stuff. Um, again, like it's early days, seven weeks. There's things that with a belt like peg to me, like I honestly, can, oh, the reason I see people one, three, six to 12 weeks and then six months after that, because I honestly think it takes about nine months for everything to totally settle down. Some of the concerns you've mentioned there um, might soften up and, and certainly some of the flatness and stuff. These could be some of the other things I was commenting on before where you move one area and then you can unveil another problem that then needs further work. So I, I, I just rest tight for the moment, involve your surgeon and really just sort of just walk through that a bit okay. Um, and have I done a tummy tuck without lipo? All the time. Um, tummy tuck without lipo um, is pretty routine to be honest. Um, um, liposuction I'll add if I need to, um, but I don't always do it. Okay. I, I, as a side discussion about liposuction, I honestly think the liposuction is heavily um, and I think it's publicised or promoted in a way that's just not right. Um, you know, the ads that are, I'm a member of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons as well as the Australian group, and, uh, and the ads that come out of ASPS in America are 18 year old girls that look like super skinny models. It's ridiculous. And, and with science saying, have you considered liposuction? It's completely misrepresented out there in the press um, and in advertising. So liposuction is all about taking away stuff so that we get a better contour. You've got to be prepared for some dimpling, a little bit of loose skin, all these things. So it's about targeting areas that are stubborn fat to try and get a better contour. All right. So I do it when I need to. Uh, I've had a tummy tuck seven years ago, but my legs are horrible and lumpy from liposuction. That's a really, that's, geez, extending from what I just said. So liposuction is about contour correction. I don't know how many of you have YouTubed liposuction. Um, it's done through a tiny hole and it's all done through uh, in, interpretation and experience. It's like working out and then thinking about how thick and, and there's, there's a bit of science and, and and a bit of art, you've actually got to really, um, you've got to be pretty well experienced in it to get the result that, that the patients are expecting. Um, to have lumpy legs from liposuction can be a combination of loose skin, it can be fat that's left behind, that's sort of, as you, you may have put weight on, that those fat cells behind have engorged a bit. Um, it could be how the scarring has formed. The internal from liposuction, I see it all the time when I'm doing lipo and then I'll do part of another procedure. Um, it looks like honeycomb. It looks like um, when you can see where I've been, it's an incredibly large operative field internally, despite it looking like it's a little stab on the outside. Um, and how that scars down can cause divots and it can pocket up. It's a fluid. It can do all sorts of things. Um, something that I do see, and certainly um, some patients um, um, come along and say, hey, is there anything you can do about this? It does, like, you know, Sometimes there can be solutions in terms of trying to re-lipo or inject fat, release scars, cut out areas to sort of tighten things up. There can be solutions. So um, I just counsel you that maybe not all is lost. Um, five weeks post-op, brachioplasty in the lipo, I wouldn't do again, I don't think. But again, liposuction, it, it's, I do lipo to the posterior aspect of the arm and the brachioplasty end to here, just so I can get down and assess the proper layers of the anatomy that I need to work around. I need to protect all the nerves and stuff that move your hand, okay? So I do take out a bit of fat from behind here to sort of bring that forward and not have this redundant stuff that can drag the skin down. So I do the lipo there, but again, as I was saying, it, it's um, something that you've just got to be, I, I, I'm really careful with lipo because I've just seen too many problems. Um, my pubic hair sticks out the top of my undies after my tummy tuck. Can that be repaired under a, a revision? Um, again, it comes down to where the surgeon placed the scar and thinking about the zones of adherence. I, the zone of adherence theory, it's, it's all anatomical based, but think about the guy at the pub with the big beer gut and he's got those tight little 4X silkies on, that you know, 32 inch thing despite having a big tummy. He's coming right down to that tight little waist. Um, and there's different areas, especially around the mom's part, where there are zones of adherence. Um, it depends on the laxity of the skin and how it stretches up. 
Um, it can pull your Mons area up um, as part of an, an abdominoplasty, depending on where the skin of fat and the zone of adherence, how lax it is. Um, if that happens, uh, patients often go and get laser hair removal. Um, but if the scar, if there's laxity down below or above, and we can try and bring things back down a bit, sometimes that can help a lot with things. Um, I need implants, but I'm super scared having something fake inside me. Is there a better brand or something? Or anything I should be asking if surgeons I see use, or are there massive standards now set in Australia? It's really concerning for me. Look, this is concerning for all of us, and it has been for a long time. Um, ALCL, which is the big lymphoma thing, the cancer that we've been talking about in the press, we've known about this for quite some time. Um, it was like, for example, in the past, people, it presents as a swelling out of the blue anywhere between three to 14 years post-op. The average is eight years. Um, and from the data that's been collected, um, in the past, people would have that happen and we would treat it and, and label it as a delayed onset seroma. And the management was to take the implant, the capsule, the fluid out and put a new implant in. There's never been a recurrent case of ALCL to date in the press. Uh, in the medical press, the literature. Um, we've been treating it like that for years and never had any problems. The trigger, the difference now is that we now know a bit more about it and what's, what's been causing it. And there's definitely a pretty uh, impressive hypothesis linking the texturing of implants to bacterial seeding at the time of implantation and the development of this problem. Uh, and that's out of some really good work here in Australia. Um, Anand Deva down in Sydney has done an amazing amount of work on this and, um, and it's setting the, the pace for the world in terms of their understanding of this problem. Um, so as we stand right now, you would have seen in the press that in France, for example, they've banned seven different brands of implants. Um, the commonality between those seven brands is that they're all macro textured. So when you're talking to a plastic surgeon, you need to think about, you need to ask what sort of texturing is involved with this implant. Now, every member of the Australian Society of Plastic Surgeons and Australian Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery in this country, um, we're getting regular updates all the time. We're getting, we, we received another one on Tuesday and I got another one yesterday. Um, you know, your surgeon that you go to should be reading those and should be able to counsel you about what your specific implant need is, okay? So um, talking to someone about, um, Talking to someone about, okay, can I get away with uh, without a lift? Sometimes you need an anatomical shaped implant, um, and with an anatomical shaped implant, um, that might lift things forward. But a lot of anatomical shaped implants are micro textured. The mental ones, for example, are documented over one in eighty six thousand incidents of ALCL. Um, some of the other older macro textured ones had rates of one in three thousand nine hundred to one in a thousand. So the mental ones are still considered pretty safe. Um, there's some newer products coming through. Um, Motiva, some of you might have heard about. Um, they've developed an anatomical implant that's really new, hasn't been completely done by TGA yet, um, so it's not readily available, but that's something that with time, it's a nanotextured implant. So um, we haven't seen any cases of ALCL in the nanotextured implants yet. Um, we've seen very few when it comes to the to the net to the micro texture but it's the macro texture ones that you probably you want to avoid these days i think there's interestingly though on that point there was a thing talking about the macro textures and actually using antibiotics and antiseptics and a surprisingly large number of one study never developed out serum so there's multiple multiple factors there you've got to make sure that your surgeon's using an implant that's going to work for the problem um, that they're presented with, but they're using things like the 14 point plan to try and deal with bacteria and minimize your risk. There's a few elements there that you want to look at. Um, Anne McCafferty, I hope I don't look like the guy at the pub. Um, Janine Cox also, is it still recommended to change the implants after 10 years? If it's not broken, leave it. Okay, um, how an implant ages in you or how you age around an implant should determine when you should have revisionary surgery done. Um, a rule every 10 years, it's a good trigger to suggest that you go and get an ultrasound or an assessment by, by a plastic surgeon to see if there's any problems that need correction. Um, but it's not 
a rule if it's not broken. Um, I do get that question all the time. People will book in and say, I've been in 10 years, I'm due for a change. And, and if it looks fine, if they've had an ultrasound or some other imaging that says they're all intact, if there's no capsule contracture, there's no looseness, waterfall, anything that they don't like, um, then I just counsel them to just keep an eye on things and just, just let it go. There's no need to change something unnecessarily. Uh, can the muscle be damaged with brachioplasty? And if so, how? Um, when you're doing a brachioplasty, uh, you should just be working on the outer surface. The arm is like a, a sausage. There's fat, there's skin, fat, and then there's a layer of fascia, which is like the outer lining of a sausage. So it's a sausage within a sausage. And there's all these muscles surrounding the bone. So with, an, with a brachioplasty, we don't routinely go anywhere. Like we're right down onto that inner sausage, but we're not actually dealing with the muscle layers. You can get inflammation around that outer layer that causes an impact on um, muscle in terms of pain, discomfort with certain activities. There are nerves in that area where the inflammation on the outside can irritate the nerves, causing a bit of radiated pain down the arm. And sometimes people have to do stretching exercises and gliding exercises for their nerves. Um, but don't damage the muscle. No, we're not, we shouldn't be going near muscles. Um, my mum's on fire for 10 years and elite. Had to have more, another seven years later, it's leaking into lymph nodes. That's what scares me. Look, it, I, I can appreciate it 100%. Um, so a lot of the silicon implants, um, if there's a concern with a rupture of the outer capsule, um, you can get some silicon bleed, um, and, and which can be picked up by the lymph nodes. Um, now, if we take the eruption of breast implant out, a lot of the time we see the lymph nodes actually come down a little bit in size. Do, are there any particular long-term implications for someone having silicon within the lymph node? Not really. Um, silicon uh, is, is present in our soil. It's, it's anything that we eat from the soil is silicon in, so our body's actually relatively used to dealing with it. Um, but certainly it can cause you alarm because it's a fibrosed and large node, especially under the arm, and when it comes to being female, worried about breast cancer, lumps and bumps, like, yeah, hands down, it's something that can cause personal distress. Um, the presence of silicon, though, within those nodes, otherwise, I, I'm not aware of any harm from that. Um, I have seen one patient who had a really extensively ruptured old implant and the silicon went into the nodes and then into the lymphatics, and there was a question about whether that should be removed or not. Um, she was asymptomatic with that. Um, I don't know what the long-term implications of that might be in terms of lymphatics from the arm draining through that zone. So certainly, like these are things which are rare, but certainly, you know, with some of the products on the market, as long as you've got a good, reliable product, that particular case wasn't. It was one of the old, the um, French ones that were taken off a few years ago. Uh, that was a different grade of silicon. Um, yeah, with the more reliable products, I wouldn't expect there to be major problems. Um, have breast, breast implants improved in the past 17 years? Yeah, they have. Um, like looking at what we've got, these are the main ones that are in use now. Um, this is a brand new thing from Motiva, which is a uh, anatomical one. Um, it's got these little suture tabs on the back. This is the one that's not completely readily available in Australia yet. I found out that I used the first one in Australia last Tuesday um, for a breast reconstruction scenario post-cancer. Um, but that's a new anatomical nanotextured implant, which is pretty impressive. Um, the Motiva ones have got a really good shell. The mental ones um, uh, have been around for longer and they do have it runs on the board like they're they're a good implant and I'm, I'm very supportive of using both of these um, but having said that that's personal as a surgeon there's plenty of other products around and lots of other people have different experience with different things so it's it's from our perspective from a professional perspective um, we just have we're just meant to know our products that we're comfortable using and know that what we want to use for you is is appropriate for you so yeah these just happen to be the ones that I use I don't have any particular chairs or financial arrangements with either of these companies I do do speaking things for them 
at certain meetings um, just based on product knowledge and what I can do with certain products for certain people. Um, and the same can be said for your surgeon that you've got as well. They, they will know a product, know that it will work, and, and they'll be able to explain why they use that product. So, yeah, don't take as gospel the brands that I use as being the best, but certainly as an example of technologies that are available in Australia, that they're some of the examples and they're good. Um, under or over the muscle, I love to gym. Personal technical things there. Um, I don't mind doing it either, but um, I do do quite a lot of dual plane. Again, surgeon dependent with um, their own um, style and and what you might need. Um, certainly people that are super active at the gym, if you put an implant under the muscle, there is a risk of animation. So that sort of patient might want to go above. Um, and I can respect that, but you've got to have a certain amount of thickness quite often or require fat grafting to hide the upper pole um, or any rippling that might result if the implant is above the muscle. Uh, can you still get the fake round look if you get a lift as well? Yes, you can. It comes down to a mixture of the implant that you choose in terms of round versus anatomical, the thickness of the gel. So um, there's three different grades of gel, and if you get a stronger gel, then it will maintain a rounder shape. Um, depending on the thickness, you can think about a lift that's implant above muscle if the thickness of the skin flaps is satisfactory, um, or if you go under the muscle, um, then just using that high profile implant uh, in the upper pole um, can give you that fake look if that's what you need. Um, you can use anatomicals that are taller as well to try and put more gel up the top. Um, it comes down to personal preference. Uh, is there a high chance of hematoma with tummy tuck? Uh, I've had one, um, and that was um, about two or, two or three years ago. Um, hematomas can just happen. Um, that was a major hematoma. I did have one that was around the hip uh, on a lady that I took back to the theatre. Um, uh, there's a lot of blood vessels around the sides, around the hip, and she was an extended tummy, and I did do some lipo to her flanks, and so whether she had some bleeding from there or from the hip vessels, I don't know. Um, but the other one I have is from the front, from I put a clip on and it came away and she bled a bit. Um, but they're the only hematomas that I've had with an abdominoplasty or a tummy tuck. Um, tummy tucks are really common operation for lots of plastic surgeons. Um, and everyone just has different runs of luck. You've just got to be very careful. And certainly um, it's seen a high rate uh, of, for some other surgeons I've seen a high rate and I'm curious on your thoughts. Um, it just comes down to care and attention. Um, so, yeah, and choosing the patient and looking for their, their preoperative comorbidities. Do people have bleeding tendencies? Um, what's their blood pressure like pre-op? Are there other undiagnosed problems that we should be looking at? Are we getting them moving too fast? Different things like that. But, yeah, I've had one hematoma in the tummy um, and I've had one around the hip and um, I'm doing an abdominoplasty Tomorrow, I did one on Tuesday. It's a pretty common operation for us to do. Um, it's an expected complication though. So certainly if you're considering uh, an abdominoplasty, you need to be prepared for potentially a hematoma. It's an expected complication with every single surgical procedure. Uh, if an implant has folded and pain is, is being experienced, will it attract a Medicare item number normally? So in November last year, the federal government took away the item number for remove and replace of implants. If you have a problem with an implant, whether it be you don't like it anymore, you're worried about the health ramifications of implants, um, there's capsular contracture, pain, discomfort, anything, then you can have it removed, not replaced, and there's an item number for that. If you have that removed and you have something put back in, and there's no underlying chest wall deformity, congenital problem, um, that was the reason why you had implants in the first place, or breast cancer that's needed a reconstruction, then you cannot get an item number for that. So federal government has said, hey, we're not assuming responsibility for your problem moving forward. We're not going to pay for the implant. We're not going to pay for the surgery if you decide to have something that they deem is cosmetic done. So they took that off us, uh, off everyone. Uh, the 1st of November last year. So yes, if it's called, if it's folded and it's causing you pain and you're happy to have it out and not put back in, then you will get an item number which will reduce your overall costs. But otherwise, if you have it put back in, no. 
Uh, and Donna, hi, Dr. Peter, see you soon. Yeah, I'll see you when I see you. Uh, I've been talking for an hour and a half now. I think I was meant to go for an hour. Um, so I'll, it's nine o'clock now and I'll, I'll call it wraps and head home and see my wife and have some dinner. Um, thank you all for the questions. Um, I hope I was able to address as many of those as possible to your satisfaction. Um, if you have any questions um, in the future, please don't hesitate to um, um, to probably get in touch with Trish Hammond through Plastic Surgery Hub and the Plastic Surgery Support Forum for Aussie Chicks. Um, or I'm available all the time. My practice is Valley Plastic Surgery in Brisbane. Um, we're in the Valley, obviously, and, uh, and it's not just me here. There's Ray Go as well, um, who's really good at noses and chins and stuff. Uh, and there's Elise Saylor, who a few of you might have heard of. She's, um, she does a lot of the, the gender reassignment stuff and does a lot of breast surgery herself, and she's excellent. And, um, and there's also Drew Cronin, who was one of our trainees for the last five years, and, um, and uh, he's good. If he wasn't good, he wouldn't be here. We really like him. So there's plenty of people that can help here if need be. Um, look, Melanie, Melissa, how many days, I'll just answer this quickly for you. How many days do your patients stay in the hospital for after tummy tuck? Um, so it depends. I tend to sort of say a minimum of three nights if possible, mainly because there's catheters and all sorts of stuff that, I, that most of my patients like to have. Um, so yeah, certainly that's, that's a pretty average number as a minimum. Most people are there for about five days. Lots of people have young kids and just want a break. So um, by all means, um, energy saving building, there you go. Um, most of the time people want a break. Anyway, I'll call it quits there. If I can help you again with anything in the future, don't hesitate to call. Thanks.